You're listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, and welcome to the Becoming Who You Are podcast. My name is Hannah, and I'm really glad you can join me today as this is going to be a follow-on episode from a previous podcast, which was about emotional tools for authentic living. Today, we're going to be talking about the rules for authentic living. But first, I just wanted to let you know about a few things that are happening over at Becoming Who You Are. Firstly, as you might already be aware, I've released a book on journaling called The Ultimate Guide to Journaling. This is an all-you-need-to-know guide to journaling that will give you more details about how to journal, why to journal, when to journal, and much more, as well as over 100 prompts and suggestions that will help you deepen your journaling practice. The book is available now through Amazon, on iTunes, as a PDF, and also as an audiobook narrated and produced by Stephanie Murphy, who you can hear on this podcast quite recently. To find out more, you can go to www.becomingwhoyouare.net and click on the banner on the homepage. While you're on Becoming Who You Are, you might also want to check out my free ebook called The Five Blocks to Authentic Living and How You Can Overcome Them. This book gives you the lowdown on the five most common things that get in the way of your truly living an authentic life and provides you with actionable steps you can start taking right now to overcome these blocks. Do take a look and tell me what you think. I really hope that both those resources will be helpful to you. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a sister episode to the last episode, which was about emotional tools for authentic living. Today we're going to talk about the rules that can go with those tools and accompany them. A rule is something that you make a choice to follow. So everything that we're going to talk about here is something that can be done if you want it. They're not necessarily easy things to do, but the important thing is that you have the choice and you're free to exercise that choice. It feels a bit funny to use the word rules because the nature of being authentic means that authenticity is different for each person. When I talk about rules here, I'm talking purely from personal experience, what I have found a really helpful grounding and what I thought might be helpful for others as well. So rule number one, is work out your principles and stick to them. So principles are one of those funny things that everyone knows they should have and everyone in theory thinks it's good to have. But actually when people exercise their principles and when people have strong principles and they really stand to them, it's actually viewed socially or can be viewed socially as quite a negative thing. Um, we, We tend to frown on people who have what we call high standards. And, for example, when it comes to dating or when it comes to career, you know, it's quite a pejorative thing to say to people, your your standards are just too high. Um, In other words, what you want will never occur. You'll never find what you're looking for. And there's also a little bit of an implication there that if someone has high standards, then they're quite high maintenance. Actually, I think standards are really, really helpful. They're helpful because they give you a framework for going through life. When you have a strong set of principles, making decisions becomes so much easier. Um, Acting on the decisions that you've made is still a challenge in itself, but actually making the decision and know where you stand with a conflict, with a situation, um, with something that someone's asked you to do, with a goal or an ambition, doing these things becomes so much easier when you have strong principles. The tricky thing about principles is that it's quite hard to get validation from other people when you have your principles. So some people will knock you for it, but I would argue that they're not the kind of people that you want around. When it comes to other people, obviously, um, when you when you create your principles, when you have your set of principles, and you feel sure about your set of principles, these are things that are really important to you. Creating a set of principles for yourself is a really considered decision. It's something that does take time and it takes effort. But the reason that that happens is because they are so important. And we hope that the people that we have in our lives are very respectful of things that are meaningful to us. If people persistently knock you for having principles or for the kind of principles that you have, they might not be people that you want around. Now, that might sound quite dramatic, but ultimately... 
It really weighs you down when you have people who are scornful of what you believe in. It doesn't create a safe environment for you to feel like you can be authentic and for you to feel safe to be authentic. And ultimately, if your principles are important to you, then you're likely going to want other people around you to share those principles or at least share the really key ones. And if people are scornful of your principles, then there's a high likelihood that they're not going to hold those principles themselves. So how do you find out what your principles are? The way I did this was to question my core beliefs until I got to a set of principles that I felt proud of. So the things that are really important to me in my life now are very, very different to the things that were important for me uh, several years ago. So for example, doing well or achieving used to be really important to me. And now what is far more important to me is doing something that feels meaningful, doing something that I enjoy. And believe me, that has made a lot of difference to the direction that my life has taken. And I think it saved me a lot of heartache on the way as well. So once you have your set of principles, the next step is to start actually living them. And for some people, it's the questioning process, the questioning of those core beliefs that can be the most difficult part. But for other people, it's actually putting those principles into action and really walking the talk, <laughs> really, really making your behavior consistent with the things that you say you believe in. It can take a bit of time to get that process going, but that action alone of just living your principles will change your whole life and it will change the way that you see the world as well. So rule number two is don't just understand, act on it. I'm going to use a little prop here, a little podcast prop here, um, because I'm a huge fan of a poet called T.S. Eliot. And he's written a lot of very complex, very profound, and very, very beautiful poetry. If you're not familiar with him, he's probably best known in general society as the writer behind the poetry used in the musical Cats, although his other work is very, very different. Now, he wrote a poem called The Hollow Man, and I, I just want to use a few lines from this to illustrate what I'm talking about when I say, don't just understand, act on it. And this is a slightly older quotation, but it's just to get the general idea. So this, this is how part of the poem goes. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls the shadow. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. So I really want to look at this idea of the shadow because I think this really embodies the concept of the distance that lies between having understanding about something and acting upon that understanding. Because in some cases, especially with historical patterns and psychological patterns, it's quite easy to understand these things about ourselves and be able to see them and say, yes, well, when I did that, it was about that. So, for example, if I have an issue with food, I can identify certain feelings or thought patterns that might exacerbate that issue, or I can trace its roots back to a certain role model or an element in my childhood. But that isn't necessarily going to automatically change my behavior in itself. So I can have that understanding, and I can still have my issues with food. It does help me be more aware of what's happening for me, but I think for a lot of people, and definitely for me, the hardest part is actually acting on that understanding and using that understanding to promote change. And I think that this in-between part, where we have an understanding about something but haven't found a way to change it, is the shadow. It's an inevitable stage during our journey, and unfortunately, it's quite easy to get stuck there. It can be the hardest place to be if we don't take responsibility for using the knowledge and understanding we have to change what we don't enjoy or like. The third rule is something I also included in the previous podcast on emotional tools because I think it's, it works in both contexts and I think it's really, really important. And this is act, don't react. So I mentioned this before when I was talking about emotional triggers. And I think the image of the shadow applies here too, because when we feel a feeling, it's our responsibility to handle it in a constructive way that isn't going to be harmful to ourselves and others. And the challenge comes with feeling something and being aware of that feeling before we act on it. Because when we catch ourselves in that moment, then we can make a conscious choice about how we behave and ultimately about the kind of person we want to be. 
And there's there's a saying that goes, it's the thought that counts, but actually I think it's the action that counts. My personal philosophy is that we can think all the things we want to think in the world, but who we really are, what really defines us as people, and how we come across to other people, the mark that we make on the world, is truly defined by our actions. So I think it is really important to really try to catch ourselves in that moment before we do something we might regret, before we might act in a way that isn't in line with our values, and be able to have that feeling that might provoke that reaction, but stop it and behave in a more constructive way. So the final rule is number four, and that is never stop learning. I included this because there is a really common perception out there that you can have done personal development and it's something that you've finished and it's over with now and you don't have to bother doing any of that kind of journaling or introspection stuff anymore because you're there. You, you, I don't know what people would say, but you're developed, I guess. Um, but I, I don't think this is true because I don't think the quest to truly know ourselves ever stops. And the reason for that is that we're constantly changing, we're constantly shifting, we're growing, and we're always in process. Life is a process. If we do enough self-searching, we can definitely get a pretty good idea of what our patterns are, and what our strengths are, and what our weaknesses are, and what behaviors and tendencies we are susceptible to. But that doesn't mean that the work stops there. We are always being influenced by our culture, our society, and the people around us. And at times it can feel like hard work to stay true to ourselves. So I really urge you to view this as a journey, not with any particular destination, but just one of those journeys that you go on for the sake of going somewhere, for the sake of the experience, because that's what life is. Life is all a series of experiences and a series of moments. And ultimately there is no destination. It is all about the journey. Part of this learning is about working on identifying our needs and preferences and how to communicate them to other people. Knowing ourselves is one step, the first step in the process, but how we express ourselves to others is just as important. When we're able to communicate our feelings and needs to other people, we're far more likely to get them met. Again, like boundaries in the last episode when I was talking about emotional tools, feelings and needs is a pretty huge topic that deserves its own podcast episode. But I wanted to mention it here because it's very related to this idea of constantly learning and growing. Because there's two parts. There's constantly learning and growing in how we know ourselves, and there's the constant process of communicating with other people. This is something that we do every single day, and it's something that we will continue today to do every single day. And that's why this is a journey. And it's a real challenge sometimes to communicate ourselves in a way that's effective and in a way that lets us show up as we really are to others. Part of life's beauty is our ability to keep learning, keep growing and keep becoming who you are. So above all else, I really hope that you never, ever stop learning. So those are the four rules that have been really important to me when it comes to my authentic living. I hope you find the content I've talked about in this podcast helpful on your own journey. As always, if you have any questions or feedback about the podcast, if you want to talk about how some of the things I've mentioned in the content might impact your authentic living, if you want to ask about any of the resources I've mentioned or anything else at all, please feel free to email me at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life. Thank you.